please welcome Dr. Phil Root. Good afternoon. Uh, as John said, we're saving the best for last. I may not be last, but I'm after John, so let that sink in. Uh, we spent a lot of time in DARPA thinking about, talking about, and then ultimately disrupting different paradigms, different ways of operating. We spent a lot of time thinking about how is it done today, the current paradigm, and then how it might be done. What is a future paradigm? And then what is the tech challenge in order to bring that together? And so as we look at some of the paradigms among those four deployed forces, uh, and in some future conflict, we see a number of paradigms that DARPA deserves some credit for disrupting. We start on the left, if you look at low Earth observations, the concept of proliferated low Earth orbit, or PLEO, for surveillance is a new paradigm for surveillance. It allows us to maintain surveillance without putting a cockpit crew in harm's way. And similarly, the concept of collaborative autonomous aircraft working with uh, an empowered human decision maker in some aircraft to complement each other, cooperate and achieve a mission is a different paradigm that we continue to explore. We do that in the undersea as well. You can imagine undersea a whole facet of different challenges associated with communications, associated with power and with range. And even in the ground domain, DARPA has disrupted previously hard-held paradigms associated with uh, off-road mobility, if you remember the DARPA uh, Grand Challenge, and what that changed in terms of the paradigm, in terms of what autonomy can do, and we continue to explore that in the RACER program of what is the fastest we could drive off-road in a safe way and complement, again, uh, those four deployed warfighters. All these ways we're exploring new paradigms of mobility, but also increasingly new paradigms associated with command and control. Command and control being a, a, a central facet of what we refer to as the Western way of war, of the, empowering those local to the situation to make the best decisions. So command is that passing of a commander's intent, a task, and importantly, a purpose to those enabled or empowered to make local decisions, and control is this passing back of feedback. But all of that, it requires communications. We feel very strongly that the right role for a human decision maker is in the place where you can appreciate the greatest context. Because we believe making the best uh, operational decision, best legal, and importantly, the most ethical decision requires you to appreciate the context, the implications of a various set of courses of action. And understanding that context requires you to understand the purpose, but also appreciate the situational awareness of the local environment. So all of that requires communications, and hence why it's so important that we be able to communicate in order to empower those human decision makers reflected here by the, uh, the thought bubbles or the, the, yeah, the bursting bubbles. Uh, but here in the shadow of Qualcomm and in the field of communications, we've seen the the uh, domain of communications support numerous changes and disruptions in, in paradigms. Uh, so communications is not homogeneous. It's actually a number of, of subfields. And what I wanted to portray here through these long arcs of research, both in blue and black, are those times where DARPA and the commercial community have pushed each other forward through a breakthrough in one to a breakthrough in any other. So if I begin in space, for example, you can appreciate that there is a long arc of DARPA research in small satellites that helped pave the way for commercial investment that ultimately yielded uh, proliferated low Earth orbit or PLEO constellations such as Starlink used with great effect in the Ukrainian crisis. And then, as I said, in the, in the shadow of Qualcomm here and in San Diego, where so much uh, breakthrough in terrestrial wireless occurs, you can appreciate that, uh, in this case, the military uh, somewhat drives the research, but also benefits significantly from all the research that is ongoing uh, here and in many places. Importantly, foreshadowing some of what you'll hear momentarily, 
DARPA has been involved in the open source community in the past, continues to be a vibrant community, particularly in the commercial space. And you'll hear some of our latest engagements with that open source community here momentarily. And then as I intimated earlier, there are new opportunities for autonomy in all physical domains, but increasingly we see opportunities for autonomy within the communications domain. So to talk about autonomy and communications, among many other topics, hope you help me uh, call forward one of our thought leaders. We call them program managers, Dr. Mary Shurgut. Thanks, Phil. Several of our current programs exemplify the symbiotic relationship between commercial innovations and DARPA investment in breakthrough technology for defense. We have programs that are looking at adapting commercial technology, others that are directly leveraging commercial infrastructure, and finally programs that are creating an ecosystem of innovation by applying open source models and commercial development practices. The first set of programs I'm going to discuss focus on adapting commercial technology with an emphasis on autonomy, from networks to ground-based to space-based communications. For example, one of my programs, Mission Integrated Network Control, is developing approaches and software to semi-autonomously manage networks that adapt given operating conditions. Mink addresses two key challenges. The first having to do with the initial configuration of a network given the multitude of control parameters within and across each subnetwork. Then given this initial configuration, how do you adapt that network in situ as the network and operating conditions change? To address this, Mink orchestrates heterogeneous network resources that include the communications links, but also the processing and storage capabilities as well. Mink borrows commercial concepts like software-defined networking that separates the data and control planes and reimagines them for networks of military radios. Mink further generalizes the concept of network function virtualization and generalizes it to build virtual edge functions, not only for the purpose of network management, but information and security management. The program is developing mission-driven networking approaches in the spirit of intent-driven or intent-based networking, which we pull from the commercial sector. Instead of creating network policies based on business intent, Mink is developing approaches to autonomously control networks by mapping mission objectives to network objectives. Staying within the Strategic Technology Office, we have the Resilient Networked Distributed Mosaic Communications Program. Run DMC is developing hardware and software to demonstrate the first ever distributed to distributed coherent communication system. But Run DMC is more than a cool name. It's addressing two key challenges in tactical networks. First, long range communications today requires fielding large antennas and high power amplifiers. This creates logistical challenges. Secondly, the specialized equipment can lead to single points of failure in the network and the system. The Run DMC program instead builds from the commercially employed concept of multiple input, multiple output, or MIMO antennas. Through spatially distributed transceivers, or tiles, Run DMC aims to provide resilient, long-range communications that's not available to the military today. A key aspect of Run DMC is that it forms a distributed, coherent antenna autonomously from a network of tiles. While the elements in a conventional phased array are generally precisely positioned and calibrated, Run DMC tiles can be placed randomly. Antenna beams and nulls are then formed by using measurements of the channel between the transmitter and the receiver. If individual tiles become disabled, Run DMC will continue to operate with a graceful degradation in performance manifested by reduced gain. In addition to achieving range extension through distributed coherent gain, Run DMC will also demonstrate the ability to interface tactical networks with commercial 5G networking technology. Okay, 
So now moving up to the space layer with the Blackjack program from the Tactical Technology Office. The Blackjack program's goal is to demonstrate a resilient architecture providing the Department of Defense with highly connected and persistent global coverage at an economy of scale not previously attainable. Blackjack adapts the emerging concept of commercial, uh, commercial constellations in low Earth orbit and demonstrates these architectures for military utility rather than for communications. Blackjack leverages these, leverages these commercial investments in proliferated constellations by incorporating production line buses, low cost military payloads, global high speed broadband data, high tempo launch campaigns, and ground infrastructure. This tr presents tremendous opportunity for the DOD to replace the time consuming, expensive approach to developing and deploying government owned space assets in place today. As I mentioned, the Blackjack program's goal is to instead demonstrate a space architecture that is resilient and allows for technology refresh every two years instead of the typical 10 or so year cycle. This will be accomplished through the proliferation of identical affordable payloads across a military satellite constellation in low Earth orbit. Related efforts are developing advanced autonomy approaches to manage and control these constellations. Blackjack's autonomous mission architecture will deliver process data directly to the warfighter on tactical timelines, seamlessly hand off between satellites and nodes, and simultaneously address multiple missions. So let's stay in space a little longer as we shift into how current programs are actually leveraging commercial infrastructure. While the Blackjack program is taking advantage of commercial technology and production timelines to develop a DOD constellation of low Earth orbit satellites, the space-based adaptive communications node program recognizes opportunity in leveraging the growing availability of commercial PLEO satellites for communications. Space Bacon is another program with a great name and awesome logo, doing important work to enable interoperability between government and commercial constellations. A growing list of companies are bringing commercial infrastructure to space, yet we as the DOD have no real way of utilizing these resources with current systems. Space Bacon is meant to be the way that the Department of Defense can leverage both government and commercial infrastructure in a comms as a service, scale on demand approach. Space Bacon will develop a reconfigurable, multi protocol, inter satellite, optical commu communications terminal that is low size, weight, and power and cost to connect heterogeneous constellations that operate on different link specifications. Ultimately, the goal of the program is to eliminate stovepipes, connect space, and enable the joint all domain fight. The wideband secure and protected emitter and receiver program, like Space Bacon, presents yet another opportunity to leverage commercial infrastructure by bridging military and commercial communication systems. Whisper is a program in the Microsystems Technology Office that is developing hardware and software to form a point-to-point -point communications link capable of connecting a network of networks. Using commercial off-the-shelf components, Whisper increases diversity in frequency, time, and geospatial dimensions. Whisper provides breakthrough performance while at the same time maintaining robust detection robust protection from detection, interference, and jamming. The ability to rapidly bridge between physically and electrically isolated networks has many applications from first responders in remote areas to disaster relief to tactical military needs. Whisper is able to address such scenarios that require mitigation of impairments like fog, rain, and foliage while still providing robust, high bandwidth RF communications links. 
Now, the expansion of low Earth orbit satellites, along with the growth of cellular networks, promises nearly ubiquitous coverage across the globe. This again presents tremendous opportunity for military use while reducing the logistical burden of deploying with military communications gear. Generating communication channels to operate is one of my programs that recently launched. Gecko seeks to develop privacy-preserving techniques to prevent pattern of life analysis over commercial networks for military applications. The Gecko program recognizes that applications and their network traffic leak information like who is talking and how often. Gecko will develop the network services and a network architecture to configure these services to jointly optimize network utility and privacy aligned with operational requirements. Gecko will use virtualization and software programmability to create the network services needed to preserve privacy while improving the quality of service compared to today's tactical radio networks. Ultimately, Gecko will enable the secure use of already widespread cellular networks in order to reduce the logistical burden of deploying military communications gear. Programs across DARPA and the DOD are leveraging and contributing open source software to create an ecosystem of innovation. Another one of my programs, Secure Handhelds on Assured Resilient Networks at the Tactical Edge, for example, provides secure, resilient data sharing at multiple security levels. Share builds from the open source named data networking library to enable resilient data exchange by caching or storing data in the network. This is in contrast to relying on a client server architecture to retrieve data. Using a distributed access control solution, Share only shares data with users authorized to see that data. Consider, for example, a disaster relief scenario in which you have federal, lo local, and medical personnel responding. Share will ensure that only medical responders can see the private health data. Now, also imagine within this disaster relief scenario, the network's infrastructure is damaged or overloaded. Share implements Name Data Networking, or NDN, to ensure that data can be shared even when the underlying network is unreliable. The program continues to collaborate with the open source community to enhance NDN and grow the capability within the DoD. Within the SHARE program, we've also employed development operations, or DevOps, motivated by commercial software development practices. By working directly with end users or operators, SHARE developers customized capabilities and prioritized features to ensure adoption and eventual transition of the technology to the warfighter. The Open Programmable Secure 5G Ops 5G program out of the Information Innovation Office, or I2O, takes the open source model even further. The Ops 5G program is developing an entire 5G software stack that is open source and secure by design. Ops 5G focuses on adding security to core networks by recognizing that future networking equipment will be built upon commodity hardware. Over time, we expect these components to not just be extensions to 5G software, but to be baked in from the get-go. The DARPA research effort is validating that uh, software is 5G standards compliant and developing secure network slicing technology. The Ops 5G software aims to be compatible with US and non-US developed hardware. With an open source approach, there is increased code visibility, meaning that code can be examined, analyzed, and audited via manual methods or automated tools. In addition, the portability of open source serves as a desired side effect to decouple the hardware and software ecosystems. In a related I2O effort, teams are investigating self-healing networks and leveraging commercially available programmable switches to rectify problematic behavior in the network. 
This is possible because these programmable switches allow for real-time line rate monitoring and in-network telemetry. And then this telemetry allows for the deployment of formally verified corrective code in the network. So with that, I hope you've enjoyed this brief overview of communications programs across DARPA focused on adapting commercial technology, requiring advances in autonomy. You've also heard about programs that are leveraging commercial infrastructure, and finally, programs that are creating an ecosystem of innovation with open source models. Really, now is the time, more than ever before, to seize opportunity and innovation across sectors. In addition to communications, the commercial and defense sectors provide mutually beneficial innovations in sensing, computing, and visualization. So back over to you, Phil, for a look at the path forward. Thanks very much. So as Mary said, we benefit from this interplay between sectors. And we're looking for ideas, further ideas, that we can leverage between sectors. And I'll offer just a couple domains of consideration by no means to do I ask that you consider this uh, complete? But in the Internet of Things, we see opportunities for the military to leverage emerging standards, for example, that would allow us to paint a situational awareness picture for those four deployed warfighters in domains that might be challenged currently. We could leverage commercial standards to more rapidly uh, form these, these uh, deployed sensing uh, networks. In augmented reality, this is a, a topic near and dear to my heart, so I used to be a uh, helicopter pilot, an Apache helicopter pilot, and we flew with a monocle on one eye, and one eye was unaided. You could consider that I was a, an AR, augmented reality hipster, but actually it was really dated equipment. But it allowed us to look laterally, look forward, look down, uh, and impose upon that some early symbology. And what I learned from that experience was that we are a visual species. We could control the aircraft, but also monitor uh, our broader situation through this, this uh, deep visual uh, sensor that we have in, in our eyeball, in our visual processing system. And so when I see augmented reality, I see an opportunity for us uh, to empower human decision makers to make the best decisions through rich contextual information. As I said, making decisions requires context. So passing as much context as possible, I believe, are real opportunities for uh, commercial advances in augmented reality to be leveraged uh, by the military. Digital engineering, also associated with uh, the digital twins, is an er era or an area where uh, the military, of course, is interested in understanding how a platform, say ship or aircraft, was built rather than as designed, and then how it is used throughout its, uh, its lifespan and understanding when maintenance is required. That is all beneficial, but we also see opportunities within a DARPA program to begin with digital models, constructive models, that then progress to virtual human in the loop models, and then finally live models. And these models progress over time and allow us to more rapidly uh, look for paradigm shifting uh, research and breakthroughs. And then finally, uh, as I'll end as we began, in non-terrestrial networking, we're seeing the military, in this case, uh, the Ukrainian military, leverage the commercial sector for communications. But we think there's much more that could be done as we look beyond just LEO constellations, MEO, and GEO, and look for resilient architectures that provide uh, greater access to uh, communications for military decision makers uh, writ large. So with that, look forward to your questions but Mayor, if you don't mind, I came up with some of my own of while you were talking. <laughs> because uh, as I look at this final slide, my, I'm asking for commercial opportunities for us to leverage. But I was wondering if you could share any uh, DARPA programs or DARPA investments that you think uh, the commercial community here should leverage. DARPA investments that the, the commercial community here should leverage. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, I always fall to the SHARE program that I took over uh, when I started at DARPA. Uh, I talked about name data networking and the NDN library. Uh, 
that actually came out of an NSF program looking at a future internet architecture. So there's this rich community um, in the academic space around building out information-centric networking, the name data networking library, and I think within the, you know, we're heavily leveraging it in SHARE, and I think we need to start thinking about a, a new internet architecture, new networking paradigms as we continue to see the, you know, additional devices. Now we have PLEO, this proliferation of satellites. So I think we need to start rethinking uh, our networking architectures and start to look at some of these capabilities that have been developed both within and across the, the defense sector and academic communities. Uh, I'm really proud of the SHARE program. Uh, and the most recently, it was demonstrated not just between echelons within the military. Uh, you, you, in your presentation, talked about police and fire and, and others, but you demonstrated between different uh, arms within the military, within the army, and external, the allied yeah. military. So that, That's that was really exciting. Yeah. So we just uh, finished up a demonstration last month. The, the SHARE program started a number of years ago. It's, it's really wrapping up, but we, we had our culminating demonstration of showing that we could exchange data between US forces and our partners. Um, and we, we partnered with the Army to do that. We've done a lot of work with the 75th Ranger Regiment. So we're really grateful for our partners that have taken SHARE you know, out of the performers' facilities, gotten it out into the field, tested it, hardened it, and it's ready to transition. Uh, another thing that came up in your talk is our work in the open source community. Most wouldn't consider the military working with open source. Any other contributions that you think think are worth highlighting or new approaches? Why do we think now is the time? Yeah, so within the 5G space, I talked about open programmable 5G. Um, there's also an OPA 5G program, and several program managers that came before me um, have served with me. They really saw this opportunity and challenge um, as hardware um, was coming both domestically, but also non-US hardware, and wanted to find a way that we could ensure that these uh, cellular ecosystems were secure and that we actually knew what was going on. So they came up with this great idea to you know, take an open source approach. So I know Tejas Patel is here from I2O, so if you have questions about Ops 5G, I know he's happy to answer them. Okay. Uh, is it fair to say the military thinks about communications through a lens of the metrics associated with latency, bandwidth, bit rate, for example. But I haven't heard much conversation surrounding resilience. Mm. And it could be viewed that we have some efforts in that space baking comes to mind. But is that fair to think that we should be focused more on resilience? Yeah, you could look at resilience in so many ways. Um, there's redundancy. Uh, there's also you know, fundamentally what makes your, your mission resilient and it's getting the right data at the right time. And that's something we're looking at heavily within the MINK program. So MINK is not only looking at your typical quality of service metrics, but also trying to look at quality of information and quality of experience and really kind of traversing that full stack all the way from what the network is. You mentioned typical yeah. quality of service metrics, but then redundancy and resilience in terms of, are you getting the information reliably where it needs to go? Yeah. Uh, you spend a lot of time with the Rangers, which has got to be a baptism by fire, because you show them something and they expect it to work all the time, back to resilience. Mm -hmm. Any stories from your time with them? I mean, doing DevOps in the field with a uh, operator that expects uh, nothing but the best must have been quite yeah. an experience. Yeah, so you have to, you have to take some risks. We, we're yeah. an organization that takes risks, but you have to find the right time in the program to bring the technology and the, the capability in front of a transition partner because you run the risk of it's, if it's not developed enough, if it's not ready enough, that they'll walk away because it's viewed as immature. But if you've gone too far in the other direction and it's so developed 
and it totally misses the mark, then they're also going to walk away. Yeah. So we're, we were really fortunate in the SHARE program to really hit it at the right time, had a fortuitous you know, encounter with the 75th Ranger Regiment, and they've been a great partner ever since. So in, in Mink and Gecko, we're gonna try to find that, that balance. In a similar way, Mink has some demanding customers, but they're their services writ large. Mm -hmm completely different. Any similarities? I mean, you're playing a central role, but almost of, to a degree of diplomat in finding solutions that work for all. Is that? Uh... Yeah, so for a little context there, Mink is really looking at the, the joint networking problem. So as we move towards a, a joint fight, it's not going to be specific to a, a particular domain. Of course, joint all domain. Uh, command and control, it's not going to be specific to a domain, it's not going to be specific to a service. So Mink has to be able to operate within and across the services and these, these networks that I talked about. Okay, great. I would love to open it up to your questions while you grab your communications device and relay it through terrestrial wireless to via the QR code and perhaps a meta lens in the future uh, to us. Uh, but with that, I had a, a while we wait. I was going to say, do I get to oppose a question to you? <laughs> I suppose that's only fair. So we, talk, we talked a lot <laughs> about commercial and defense. Um, are there new collaboration mechanisms for yeah, commercial yeah. and defense to work together? Yeah, uh, well played. So what just happened, um, typically we don't expect our program managers to ask for funding on a stage. We typically do that behind closed doors. <laughs> so. Uh, when our, our program managers are quite entrepreneurial, so we'll do this in real time. Um, uh, so we have, a, a, if you're aware, the, the DARPA Bridges program. Bridges uh, stands for something, but you can, the, the picture that evokes is appropriate because there are communities within the small business community that, that have some capability but have a difficult time talking with, uh, with DARPA, with DOD, because uh, they don't have a security clearance. So unless you have a security clearance, a facility clearance. You can't accept a classified proposal. If you don't have a proposal, then you can't propose to it, which means you can't be on contract, which means you can't have a security uh, facility clearance. And so you have this unvirtuous cycle. And so we launched the, the Bridges program to try to break that. And it's a consortia that uh, awards small grants to small businesses. So now you have a government contract uh, now you can apply for a facility clearance, but importantly, we can uh, hear ideas and foster conversation. Uh, of course, that requires some nominal funding that is in the benefit of a program manager. So I look forward to hearing uh, what topics are of interest and what communities we could, we could reach out to. So yes, DARPA Bridges uh, is, we're uh, going to launch the first topic uh, soon, and it, it will be our first turn through this process of working through the consortia to foster a conversation, again, broaching conversations between the two sectors, between the civilian and military sectors. Thanks. Uh, first question, if DARPA is levering commercial advances to complement or improve future DOD networks, is there a desire for DARPA research to also inform commercial networking advances? Do you have any examples? We've talked about this some. Uh, I'm happy to jump in. Please do. I will jump back. Um, I would say yes, there is interest. So Phil started to talk about non-terrestrial networking. And for those that are, are following the 5G standards, non-terrestrial networking is mentioned in the standards. So this idea of actually taking your cellular network and connecting it with low Earth orbit satellites or any non-terrestrial um, components. So we do have some early efforts that are looking at the opportunities and the challenge space here. So that is certainly one area ripe for DARPA, you know, pushing the, the 5G non-terrestrial networking community along and really finding military utility between, behind those innovations. So related question, mm -hmm. uh, when I think non-terrestrial networking requires some autonomy, some processing on the stack, on orbit, Mm -hmm. to optimize networking and communication paths, et cetera. That autonomy, in my background as a roboticist, requires to think about testing. Are there challenges associated with testing a, uh, for communications autonomy? Yeah, I'll, I'll lean on the idea of live virtual constructive. So there 
are a number of you know, simulation uh, capabilities as well as uh, satellite emulation capabilities that we can draw on and create a, a rich scenario. Um, but do you have you know, other, other examples? I know it's, it's, we rely on communications. You, in many cases, you can't accept a dropped call. And so we need a degree of uh, what I refer to as trust calibration, understanding to what degree we can trust autonomy writ large, and certainly in communications, uh, it provides new opportunities because if I have an autonomous platform, I need to trust, I need to calibrate the trust that it operates within its environment correctly. But in communications, you can bake in a degree of resilience that is new to the domain of robotics autonomy. And so it seems that there's, uh, we could be learning from the communications autonomy mm -hmm. community that informs some testing method because you can bake in resilience in a way that's needed and uh, inherent in the domain of communications. Open thought. Uh, next question is, does DARPA have programs to prevent pollution of open source code by adversaries? Yeah, so I touched on this a little bit in the, in the section of the talk where I, I mentioned the Ops 5G program. And the, the thought there is that because the software is open, uh, you're able to analyze it, audit, and do that via not only manual methods, but also automated means. So the Ops 5G program uh, is developing techniques to ensure that the 5G software is standards compliant. So I think within DARPA and I2O especially, they're starting to create the, the tools and mechanisms to ensure that the code in Ops 5G and, and more broadly is secure and is not being polluted by adversaries. And you have this whole ecosystem not just the, the DARPA performers looking at that Ops, that Ops 5G code, but you have it, it's open. Anyone can look at it, which you know, is a double-sided coin. Yeah. Does DARPA have or will encourage research bringing in connectivity to the 46% of the still unconnected world, leveraging the rich backbone of cellular and satellite communications? Do you want to start? Sure. I mean, I, th I think that's where the, the commercial opportunity comes in with the proliferation of PLEO satellites. Um, we, I talked about the Space Bacon program that's allowing for the development of a terminal that will allow for connection of the commercial and the DOD satellites. Um, I, I have a feeling there's, there's some thoughts and ideas behind this question. So <laughs> yes, I, I the kind I of thoughts that, that. Uh, are shared at the next coffee break. Yes. But, uh, I do think that DARPA is interested in this space because you can imagine if the answer is yes and we're able to deliver this, then it would be low cost, proliferated access with a high bandwidth network. So that's exactly what the military would need in a place that we didn't expect. And so if we could f catalyze a commercial opportunity here, that would be of significant benefit, not only for uh, some, the 46% as referenced in the question, but also for military use. And that's really a sweet spot for DARPA. Is there a way we can change the world, but also provide for national security? Uh, that opportunity doesn't exist very often. Perhaps this is one. Next question. What are the comms challenges talking not only between branches, but also with other NATO forces as we move to better utilize the RF spectrum? Uh, you talked about some uh, of the SHARE program, yep. the ability to work with partners and allies. But SHARE has a unique approach on the RF spectrum. Is there anything more you want to say about shared spectrum? Um, in terms of shared spectrum, fundamentally, you know, there's ownership of the spectrum and governing rules around spectrum. Um, if I could you know, take this in the direction, again, pulling on SHARE, um, SHARE is integrated with the Tactical Assault Kit, or TAC, and TAC is widely used amongst not only U.S. forces, but also um, partners are using it as well. So I think from a, a model, uh, sharing model, no pun intended, a sharing model perspective, the, the TAC ecosystem, the TAC Product Center, provides this mechanism for sharing, and perhaps there's, or this mechanism for being able to exchange data 
still, again, too, too many puns here, <laughs> but I think there could be something similar um, formed around the spectrums, uh, sharing, shared use of the spectrum, and that's where software-defined radios could come in, uh, the GNU radio project, um, also a rich ecosystem of, of open source software. Next, can you please talk about NTN and what DARPA thinks the hard problems are associated with non-terrestrial networks? DARPA is trying to figure out what those hard problems <laughs> around non-terrestrial networks are. So if you have thoughts and ideas, um, I think the, the grander thought here is um, similar to how the Gecko program that I talked about really looks to leverage the availability of commercial infrastructure as cellular starts to be integrated with satellite communications, how can we leverage that? Can we go beyond sharing data and start computing over data? One response I'd offer is resilience, and space bacon takes a bite of mm -hmm. that, but I think there's more that can be done to provide resilience, particularly with a greater deal of compute available on orbit. Uh, we could look at different architectures because what we desire is Low latency and high bandwidth, sure, but fundamentally what we require is, is a degree of resilience that hasn't been a significant part of the conversation to date. What research are you or others at DARPA doing to understand how warfighters actually interact with, process, and prioritize all of these types of multimodal communications to make decisions? I will take that one. You, um, I will step in. <laughs> So I, I would say a, a bulk of the warfighters just want the network to work. They don't care about, necessarily care about the exact details of how it works, but there is a community within the services that does have a deep you know, understanding, a deep uh, commitment to ensuring that the communications and the networks continue to work. Within the MINK program, as part of the task of orchestrating networks, we're building a network situational awareness tool that will uh, give uh, an, a, a signals operator or a joint signals operator insight into what the network looks like, what types of network resources are in the environment, um, how they're performing, and that's where we're incorporating that DevSecOps early into the program to get that feedback from the operator that truly is you know, focused on the network, is focused on the communications. And then final question, what do you think are the greatest opportunities and threats slash risks associated with the use of commercial communications technology in military applications? I'll add the question mark. No, no, for uh, you. I will go first. Please do. Okay. Oh, I just ended in a question mark, so I added uh, that for you in case you're oh, reading along. Um, okay, so I don't, I don't think we can truly back to reliability, redundancy, resilience, I don't think we can truly always rely 100% on communications. We need to have a multitude of paths, a multiple, multitude of links that we can rely on to send our data, to send the right data, the right information. Um, so I think the, the greatest risk is if we begin to rely solely on commercial op, uh, networks and cellular networks. With that, thank you for your audience. Look forward to conversations uh, out in the hallways during the next break or thereafter. Uh, but I'll end with a plea. If ever you have an idea and want to work with DARPA, we would jump out of the opportunity to connect either with your idea or importantly, if you think it's now is the time for you to stand your watch at DARPA, contribute more personally, be a thought leader like Mary and join the DARPA team for some short period of time. We'd love to have that conversation as well. Many thanks and enjoy DARPA Forward.